Welcome back to our Literal Genesis series, where here we aim to hold firmly to Scripture and loosely to theories. Again, why do we do that? Because Scripture never changes. That's our anchor. That's our rock. That's our solid uh, point for our worldview as Christians. And the theories of man, theories of us flawed humans, uh, well, they change. They change all the time. And as we get new evidence, they have to change and they morph. And so we always want to hold firm to Scripture. But particularly when we're talking about this, this theory of evolution, this idea that rocks could somehow turn into rocket scientists uh, over eons of time. This is a theory that we want to investigate and, and ask these critical questions of, uh, and then we want to hold very loosely, uh, because in my estimation, Scripture does not support it at all. The last previous sessions, if you'll remember, we kind of talked about this idea of DNA, and DNA is, is, is like a manual. It's, well, it's a set of manuals, a set of manuals on how to create a human being, how to maintain that human being, how to regulate that human being. And if you remember the analogy that we used, it was like comparing DNA to how to build an airplane. If you have all these manuals sitting around in a hangar on how to build an airplane, um, it's kind of similar to that concept, but not just building an airplane from parts that are already lying around. But remember, having to go create those parts when we need them, how to mine them out of the earth, how to, how to form and shape the metal. And where we left off on our previous session was that when we make changes to that manual, now again, if evolution is true, the manual has to change or you'll only ever get what the manual wants you to create. So when we change this manual by accident, it tends to degrade living things. Uh, things tend to go downhill. Uh, so that's kind of where we left it off, and in this session what I want to do is pick it up, and again the title, Evolution's Extinction Engine, because when we change the manual, when we make changes to this delicate, intricate manual, uh, it tends to take things down in the wrong direction. And today we'll take a little bit deeper dive into DNA, and we'll look at some, some very fascinating, uh, intricate things uh, inside today that, that again just blows the mind when you think about how a blind three-year-old, in my example, uh, totally based on random chance, could create the, these wonderful things that we see in nature. We'll look at four dimensions of the genome today. So th there's actually more dimensions we could talk about, but uh, I'll pick four because that's a nice number to begin with. And what I want to do is start with the, the genetic alphabet. If you ever heard of, of that, uh, that term, genetic alphabet, here's what it's referring to. These four letters, A, T, G, and C. Now, I don't want to leave you the impression that when we look inside the cell and we look at DNA, we see these letters. We don't, we don't see these letters at all. We see four chemicals, and these are the letters that correspond to those chemicals. And when I'm teaching students, I, I sometimes come up with, with easy way to remember things, and an easy way to remember these letters is to put uh, this with them. A, T, G, C, Advanced Technology, God's Creation. A, T, G, and C. And of course, that's the way I remembered. You can have your own way if you like. Um, but where we get these A, T, G, and C is actually from, from chemicals. You can see the four chemicals here on the right-hand side of the, uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, a is for adenine, T is for thymine, G is for guanine, C is for cytosine. So when we look at DNA, we see these four chemicals repeated over and over and over in various patterns all throughout the, uh, the genetic uh, code. And how big is this code? Well, if you think of it like the ladder here that's kind of shown to the left of the chemicals, and if you, if you look, think of it a ladder, you've got two sides of that ladder, and you got rungs up and down the ladder. If you split that ladder in half and you kind of, kind of open it ap apart, or unzip it, if you will, um, then you'll kind of get an idea of what we're talking about on this code. The code is read half of the letter. The other half of the ladder, excuse me, the other half of the ladder is not read. And this ladder contains about 3.2 billion rungs, half of it. Uh, so if you look at the entire genomic code, it's actually going to be 6.4 billion uh, letters. So it's, it's a big, it's a really, really large, uh, large code. We'll look at what, we, what we mean by this code here in just a moment. Um, but when we talk about the ladder here and these, these base pairs, uh, going forward, this will make more sense when we look at the code, but just, just know this, that we're not talking about letters. We're actually talking about chemicals, uh, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Okay, so the first dimension that I want to look at, 
What we're looking at here is the first 700 letters, if you will, or 700 chemicals of the, the human Y chromosome. Now, the Y chromosome is found in males. We kind of talked about it in an earlier lesson as well. And the way that these chemicals are read is three at a time. So I have the first three letters highlighted, C, T, and A. So remember, we don't see the letters, but we see the chemicals, cytosine, thymine, and adenine, right? These are the first three chemicals of the genetic code of the Y chromosome. And the way that uh, we want to think about all these letters here kind of jumbled together is this is more like a, a chapter in a recipe book. And inside of this chapter, we have recipes for different kinds of things that we need to make if we're making food, for example. And in the genetic code, it's no different. So out of all of these letters in the Y chromosome, the first 700, there's a section of these that's going to be for a specific type of a recipe. In other words, the letters that I have highlighted here tell the cell how to build a specific part. Now, in a previous lesson, we looked at the bacterial flagellum, you know, the tail that uh, spins and makes that bacterium uh, go and move around in the cell. And let's say one of those parts of the tail, if you remember, was a rotor. Another part was a stator. So let's say that this section here tells the cell how to build a part that's going to become a part of the rotor, right? This is the way we would look at this. So you'll see different sections in here are going to be responsible for different parts. And that's basically how it works. Now in the human genome, there are about uh, 22,000 of these places that code for parts or proteins, if you will. When I say parts, I mean proteins. When I say prote proteins, I'll, I'll mean parts. So 22,000 places in the cell, which would lead you to believe that the human cell can create 22,000 parts. Um, that's really not the case. We'll see uh, coming up here in a moment. But just for now, note that there's 22,000 places in the cell in the DNA, which actually code for a specific part. And this is read linearly. So from beginning from the first letter to the last letter in this section, that's going to remain be one part. And by the way, this is exactly how computers work today in, when we think of coding, right? We, we start with a piece of code, we read sequentially. Uh, I'm going to use it in human terms from left to right. Uh, so we're very familiar with this. I did coding for a number of years early in my career, and I wrote code like this all the time. Very, read very, very sequentially. Okay, so this is the first dimension, right? Uh, nothing too surprising here, I don't think, except for the fact that we have a code. We haven't really talked about that yet. Uh, so speaking of, of codes and, you know, codes and decoding, you know, when we talked about those airplane manuals, so we imagine that hangar full of all of these manuals on how to do the mining, the refining, and everything that we talked about before. And we raised the question, okay, it's great. We have all these manuals. Now what? We have an airplane, right? Well, no, of course not. We, we have instructions for how to build it. But unless we have something that can understand it, it doesn't do us any good whatsoever. In order to demonstrate that, I'm going to go to Daniel 5.25, where in this verse we, we have this, this message. So kind of setting the context here, we have King uh, Belshazzar, who's, uh, who's holding a feast for a thousand people. A thousand people, just probably a few of his closest friends, maybe a few relatives, right? A thousand people, no big deal. Now... Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar, had actually robbed the gold vessels, you know, plates, utensils, and, and, and chalices and cups from, from Jerusalem. They, they, they stole them, right? They took them from, from Jerusalem. And Belshazzar thought this would be a great time to break out those golden vessels, right, during this feast with a thousand people. And that's what he did. They got the golden vessels, they began to eat, and while they were having their feast, a hand emerged with fingers that resembled a human hand and began to write on the wall. Now, where did that hand come from? Another dimension, perhaps. Maybe that's a future lesson we can talk about when we talk about dimensions. But you can imagine this kind of startled Belshazzar, and probably all of his guests as well. And this is what was written on the wall. Now, this meant absolutely nothing to the king. In fact, it didn't mean anything to anybody at the banquet. Uh, the king called in his, his cabinet, right? his trusted advisors, his wise men, and they didn't know what it meant. So the first thing we need to remember about a code or a language is if you're the only one that knows how to decode it, 
is absolutely useless. It doesn't do anybody any good. In fact, I remember in high school, um, uh, one of my, my best friends and I, we, we created our own secret language, right? So that we could uh, write things in class and kind of pass them back and forth and no one would know what we're talking about. We could talk about the teacher, we could talk about other students, and it was just, uh, it was just good fun, right? Well, um, it was fun until our computer teacher discovered the note and being as smart as he was, he deciphered our language and then he understood it. Um, but but the, the idea here is that me and my friend, we agreed upon this language, this syntax, so that we could understand what the language was. And if God was going to convey a message using a coded language, there has to be someone that can decode it. Well, there was. In this case, it was Daniel. Daniel decoded the message, and he delivered this message to the king, that God has numbered his days, uh, he had been weighed and measured and found deficient, and that his kingdom was going to be taken over by the Medes and the Persians. And that's what this code meant when it was decoded. Now, DNA is the same way. If you have this code and you don't have something that can understand it or decode it, it does you absolutely no good. And in our cell, this is where those, those enzymes, those workers come in, right? They can read the cell, they can unzip the DNA, they read them three letters at a time, and they know what these letters mean and how to decode them. And in this example, I've highlighted three letters, C, G, and T. And in the decoding language of the cell, CGT means arginine. That's one of the 20 essential uh, amino acids that, that makes up uh, well, the living things require. And then just below that, I've got the chemical makeup. You can see it's got hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and how those kind of kind of bond together there. But an amazing question, or amazing thing we need to look about this code is, who told the cell to read these chemicals three letters at a time? Now, in retrospect, we can think hindsight-wise, well, it must be in three if we're going to have 20 amino acids and we can work out the math, but that's hindsight. How did these cells, how did these enzymes know initially when I'm unzipping the DNA to read them three at a time, it's called a codon, who told these enzymes to do that? You need two people at least at a minimum or two entities involved that know the code if you're going to have communication. And in this case in DNA, we have DNA, we have enzymes, and there's our, our two entities there. Pretty amazing. All right, so looking at the second dimension, something very interesting happened. So after the Human Genome Project, when, when the uh, genome was decoded, or we thought we had decoded everything there was to know about DNA, we were just actually scratching the surface. You know, remember we, we said there are 22,000 places, and we'll call them genes, they're instructions on how to build a part. Well, the problem is the human body can make more than 500,000 distinct parts or proteins. Well, we only have 22,000 places where we have instructions for a part. How can the body do this? How can the cell do this? This is absolutely amazing. 22,000 instructions to make a part, yet we have 500,000 parts. How does that happen? Okay, let's take a look at this. So I've got a, got a section of the genetic code here, beginning with A and ending with T. Now, in reality, these, these genes, these instructions are much larger than this. On average, they're about 27,000 letters, 28,000 letters on average, right? Some get much, much larger. So how does the body do this? Well, it does this by something called splicing, which we'll look at here in a moment. But for now, know that uh, when, we take, when the cell takes an instruction set like this one, there's going to be pieces of it or chunks of it that aren't involved in the instruction process. The, the cell doesn't need them to build that part. So when a cell needs to build a, a stator, for example, uh, for a bacterial flagellum, it'll take the instruction set here and it knows like these black and white pieces, I just, I, I colored them black and white just for illustration purposes, that the cell knows not to use those. So what it ends up with is it using, uses the color pieces, the, the yellow and the, the purple and, and, the, and the, the green, and it pushes them together. So that's the instruction set. And to further illustrate this, I have a, a section of DNA here with some color-coded tape. Now the color-coded tape 
is going to represent the pieces of instructions that the cell needs. And then the darker colored on the rope is the parts that, that aren't needed. So when this gene is red, you can see there's a lot that's not needed. In fact, this is how it is in our DNA. The, the part that's needed, they call uh, exons, and the part that's not needed, we call introns. But essentially what we want to end up with is these colors together making our recipe, right? Making our instructions, if, I can, if that even looks correctly, right? And then these, these parts that are kind of below and looped, they're snipped out, they're cut out, so that we wind up with only the pieces that we need. Now, this is absolutely fascinating, that these enzymes can go to this section of code, take out this section of code, and know which pieces to snip out in order to get the final recipe. It's called splicing. Now, you may be asking, well, how does, an, how does this worker in the cell know how to do this? Well, we're not going to get into all that complexity, but just know that inside, inside of here, there are actually markers, beginning markers, ending markers. I want you to think about this. As we're, as we're talking about this, now evolution is that blind three-year-old, right? Has no brain, has no intelligence, has no forward thinking, doesn't keep a scientific notebook. Everything's just happy, random, chance, and, and, and coincidence and accident. It's, it's mind-boggling enough to think that accidents can create a language or a code, because that never happens. That's not our experience. That's not evidential. But you take this a step further to say not only can it do that, but there's a code within a code. There's stop markers or start markers in here. There's places that tells that enzyme where to snip, what places to cut out. How does that happen by chance? How does that happen without a mind? This has all the hallmarks of design, if you can open your eyes to see it. But the, uh, the magic doesn't end there, okay? Remember, we have 22,000 places that code for parts, but we can make 500,000 parts. Now, this is where it gets even more interesting. What the cell can do is take these parts that it keeps, the exons, and it can rearrange them and make different parts out of the same code. Let me just build this out. The second stage here, notice I've just rearranged the colors here. Now I put the colors in here so we can kind of see that I'm changing things around. Instead of it being green, purple, yellow, now it's green, yellow, purple. Or I could just use two of them, yellow and purple, or purple and green. So you can see how the cell can do this mix and match. This is how we take 22,000 instructions and we get 500,000 different parts out of them. This is absolutely genius because it's efficient, right? We're, we're, we're having the smallest amount of code in the smallest amount of space and being able to rearrange it and get all these different parts. Well, why not just include all of these instructions piece by piece in the genome? You'll see that here in a moment. The genome is quite large and it's got to go in a very, very tiny place in the cell. How do, you, how do you maximize efficiency? Well, this is one way. You're using the least amount of parts and getting the most amount of results out of it. Accident? Chance? Man, we're sure lucky. We're sure lucky to be here, aren't we? And I say that tongue-in-cheek. I, 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 there's a mind behind this. There's intelligence behind it. And so each one of these combinations will produce a different part or a different protein. Okay, it's alternative genetic splicing, and our cells know how to do this. Those enzymes, those workers in the cell, they know how to do this. They know how to read and decode the language, and they know how to read the start signs and the stop signs, and they know exactly how to do this, and they do it very well. However, because we live in a fallen world, if we go, everything to me, you can kind of trace back to Genesis in one way or other. And remember in Genesis chapter 3, when sin was introduced into the world, that there was, this, there was punishment. Remember we talked about thorns as being a part of that punishment. And I talked about Colossians 1 where it says, in him all things hold and, and consist and hold together. And, and maybe God just held back a little bit of his holding power. And what we see now is we, we see things that are not exactly perfect. God's once perfect creation is now no longer perfect. So there are imperfections in this process. They're called splicing errors. Now, initially, when this was discovered, those who held to the evolutionary ideology would say, well, this is how 
evolution had a playground to kind of work and, and, and test things. Well, the more knowledge that we had, the more we found out uh, this really can't be true because when things go wrong in this splicing, uh, that produces diseases. Uh, things like cystic fibrosis is a splicing error. What I mean by splicing error? Well, let's say that the splice doesn't end at this G here in the green, but it goes over into the dark. And so it's got more code than it should have to build a part. Well, it's not going to build the right part now, is it? Because it's spliced in the wrong area. Cystic fibrosis is one of those. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy, that's another. Um, muscular dystrophy, there's one way that muscular dystrophy happens that's due to splicing errors. Now, speaking of muscular dystrophy, there, there's, there's one gene, one instruction set that, that codes for a part, and this part's called dystrophin, it's a protein. It's a really, really long instruction set in the body. In fact, it's about 2.5 million genetic letters. It's huge, it's humongous. How much of those letters get used and how much gets spliced out? 2.2 million out of that 2.5 million actually get removed. So you're left with about 300,000. Um, and you might be asking, well, what, is, what do these, these black and white places do? Why are they in there? Well, initially evolutionists thought this is junk. This is leftover from the evolutionary process because when we look at the entire genome, only 2% actually coded for parts. What was the other 98% for? Well, it must be junk. Now, here's where your worldview affects your science. Well, if that's junk, why would I look at it? Why would I bother doing science on that part? But if your worldview is based on the Bible, where God doesn't make junk, things were perfect at the beginning and decayed and goes down over time, well, I might want to find out what uses are, are in those introns, those places that don't code for parts. So it turns out they're very, very important. And now we know that nearly the entire genome, including those places that don't make parts, are essential. Things for like reg regulatory processes. So this is the second dimension of the genome. This alternative splicing basically gives us a code within a code. Think about that for a moment. We have our 22,000 codes, but within those codes, there are codes that live inside of them, and the body knows how to bring these about. We don't program this way. This is not a way we typically program. So going back to this idea of why the efficiency in alternative splicing? Why do we need this? Why not just put all the instructions in there and have each one kind of laid out sequentially? Well, let me lay out the problem. The problem is that we take one of our cells, just one of our cells, and we have trillions, we take the DNA out and we put it end to end. In one cell, that DNA is gonna be about six and a half feet tall, or about two meters. That's a lot. That's a lot of material to cram down into a microscopic cell, not just the cell, but the nucleus of the cell, which is about 10 micrometers wide. Uh, that's really, really small. Now, to, to give us a kind of a little better example, if we take the cell nucleus where this DNA lives, and we say, let's just make it the size of a soccer ball. If it's the size of a soccer ball, that means we need 50 miles of DNA to be crammed inside of this space. This is why it's important that DNA folds properly. This is why it's important that it be able to be unzipped easily and quickly when we need to read the code. Um, this is why we have alternative splicing to make this the best possible use of this small space. Oh, and just uh, kind of a, you know, neither here nor there, uh, the 22,000 genes that we have, by the way, um, worms also have 22,000 genes, so. You can draw your own conclusions there. Uh, that, was, that was one of the big questions. It's one we found out, hey, we've got the same amount of genes as worms and jellyfish, uh, yet we are much more sophisticated. Well, alternative splicing goes a long way in that regard, doesn't it? Okay, so talking about uh, another dimension here, um, is still thinking about this three-dimensional space. That genes that are used, like when you're creating a part, you may need to follow different kind of instruction sets to create the whole part. For example, that, that motor on the bacterial flagellum that, that whips that tail around, you've got the rotors, you've got the stators. So you're gonna have instructions that for efficiency, they need to be close to each other. Remember the genome, 
3.2 billion letters long, um, it makes no sense to have instructions for the base part of that, that, that tail to be spread out across the entire genome. Uh, for efficiency, they need to be close together. Yet what we find is when we spread the DNA out, sometimes these instructions are not close together at all. They're far apart. But we're not thinking third dimensionally. Because when this DNA is in the cell and when it's folded, let's take these two instruction sets here. Let's say that they're used together often. That if one used, almost always the second one is used. Well, when the DNA is folded in the cell, then they become closer together in three-dimensional space. Accidental? Blind three-year-old? I don't think so. This is, this is next level, next level storage, right? When we can take these, these genetic loops inside the cell, inside the nucleus, and, and have this type of proximity for the, for the genes that we need, that we often use, this, this is, again is making the best possible use of that tiny, tiny space. So this is the third dimension uh, of DNA that I wanted to point out today. Pretty incredible. We don't program like this either. We don't know how. Imagine taking, taking a book, uh, your favorite book, and then folding it in half, and then being able to read top down through the book and have it make sense with the words and everything. We don't even know how to program like that, right? Uh, sure, there's palindromes and we can do things like that, but we, we don't program like this because computers can't decode like this. They're, they don't know how to do it. Even if we know how to do it conceptually, we can't get a computer to do it. And looking at, at this complexity, you know, with the compactness and the folding and the alternative splicing, now, this molecular biologist said this, it was just like seeing another planet, this whole new world, you get lost in it. Now, I just want to take just a second and remind us the difference in something that, that man makes and, and what God makes. Now, I don't believe nature did this by accident. This is, this is a product of a mind. You take something, and I think I've used this example before, you take something like a razor blade, it's, when you hold it up, it's, it, it looks exquisitely sharp and fine. You put it under a microscope and you blow it up, 3,000 magnification. What do you see? It's not a straight line, is it? It's jagged. In fact, it, it looks terrible, like, wow, I'm putting that on my face. But when you magnify something that God has made and you go deeper and you go deeper into it, the more your jaw drops. You don't see imperfection, you see more and more complexity. You can imagine Darwin, back in his day, under a microscope that he had, looking at a cell, seeing the nucleus, not knowing what was inside of it, but kind of seeing lumps inside, you know, like uh, it's kind of a lumpy, uh, gelatinous material, had no idea. And then over the last 100, 150 years, we've been able to develop technology to take us deeper, deeper. And what looked unimpressive initially, it's, it's a whole other world, as this molecular biologist has said. And what's even more amazing to me is that this is discoverable. God didn't make things that was so uber complex that we could not discover them and understand the processes. There's some things, we, well, a lot of things, we still don't understand. But as we go and as time goes on, we can understand more and more. So now let's talk about the fourth dimension. I don't want to look at today. So remember we had the, the sequential dimension where we read kind of the, you know, one letter at a time in the genetic alphabet. We have the alternative splicing, right? We can kind of mix and match one instruction set to get different parts, absolutely mind boggling. And then we have this, this concept of folding. And I've only talked about folding in one aspect, and that is Inside of that nucleus, you can imagine all this stringy DNA everywhere. Some of it is kind of like wadded up into tight parts, and other is kind of loosely packed because different cells need different instruction sets. For example, a cardioblast cell in my heart, it needs different kind of instructions than a liver cell that's, that's working on metabolism, for example. They don't, they don't do the same things. Uh, they'll need some of the same instruction sets, sure. Now here's part of the fourth dimension that we want to understand. Different cells need different types of instructions from the same set of DNA, and that instruction set can change over time. Time is the fourth dimension. 
This is something that was just recently kind of discovered in the last couple of years. Uh, well, at least it was more fully known in the last couple of years. And I'll give you an example. Let's go to the liver. So in our, in our liver, so we talked about our cells and nucleus. We have um, 23 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. But in the liver, some cells have more than that. Well, now wait a minute. When we were talking about chromosomes, I said, if you have an extra chromosome, that's, that's generally bad news. That's tied to a disease, right? And it's not good. Well, that's true when that's throughout your whole body. But in your liver it needs certain set of instructions and it needs to get to them very quickly and create these parts very quickly, such as in metabolism or, or detoxification. And in order to do that, it actually makes copies of what it needs. Rather than God saying, hey, I'm going to put these extra copies in every cell all throughout the body and make that tight space even, even more crowded, no, the liver just says, hey, I need these sets of instructions and I need, I need, to, I need mass production. I need multiple workers making multiple parts out of these at the same time, so I'm going to make copies of it. That's how it can change over time. In our brains, we, we have this uh, concept of jumping genes. Uh, whenever I say jumping genes, it reminds me of a childhood video I used to show my kids. Uh, teaching them the letter J, you know, jumping Jane. If, if you don't know about it, that's okay. But these jumping genes are also called transposons meaning that these genes can move places throughout the genome in certain brain cells. Now, initially when this was discovered, again, with the evolutionary mindset, they were tempted to say, well, they weren't tempted to say, they said, ah, this is left over from an evolutionary ancient virus. Well, turns out that's not the case at all, that these transposons, these jumping genes are absolutely vital to brain development. We wouldn't have the kind of brain we have without them. Now, in case you didn't catch that, this is very subtle. The DNA, the genome, can reprogram itself dynamically over time. That's, uh, you go way beyond chance and probability when we're talking about a code that can dynamically reprogram itself without messing itself up. Ah. Uh, Computer scientists dream of this, to be able to develop code that can dynamically change itself over time without destroying itself or running out of control. We don't know how to do this. Computers don't even know how to read this if we could figure out how to do it. But this is the fourth dimension that I'll, I'll want to leave on today, and that this whole thing can change itself as it needs to over time. Not in an, a macroevolutionary kind of way, but in a maintaining growth and development kind of way. It's very controlled. So there's the four dimensions of the genome. Now again, hopefully as we went through this, you kind of thought to yourself, how would a blind, unintelligent, random process do this over time? This is, this is not the process of chance. This is the process of intelligent design, and we can see this right here in our cells. Now I'm not the only one who thinks this. There are evolutionary scientists who believe the same thing that this must be the product of a mind. And here, I want to talk about Francis Crick. If you recognize the name, uh, Dr. Crick is one of the co-founders of the structure of DNA. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize in 1962 along with his colleague, um, you know, Watson and Crick, if you've kind of heard the pair talk together. And to overcome the, this hurdle, right? So once he discovered the co-structure and they began to learn more and more about DNA and the code, he knew. He knew this could not be the product of chance. Codes don't create themselves. I don't care what the medium is, whether it's nature. It doesn't matter. Codes don't create themselves. So he wrote a book called Life Itself. And he proposed an alternative theory. Not a God theory. That, that is an alternative theory. What did he say? What did he propose? You ready for this? He said that some form of primordial life was shipped to Earth in spaceships billions of years ago by some more evolved civilization. Because, hey, if there's aliens out there, they must be you know, more intelligent than we are, right? And, and that's how life got started on Earth, is that some mind created the code, they, they kind of kick-started the process and then shipped it to Earth, and then chance and, and you know, eons of time took over from there. Uh, two comments on that, uh, just real quick. One, really? Alien civilization? 
A Nobel Prize winner writes a book and he's serious about this alternative, but you know, it's, it's not really funny. It's true. He's absolutely correct that there's no way this, the, the genome could have written itself. It doesn't matter how much, you could have an eternity worth of time, it'll never happen. Just like that hangar full of airplane manuals, I asked the question, how long would it take for these manuals to write themselves? No one ever says, well, so, uh, two minus eight, uh, uh, 10 billion years. No one ever comes up with a number because they know it's impossible. You can't do it. Same thing here. Now, by saying that there's aliens out there that did it, that's just kicking the can down the road because that begs the question, where did the aliens come from? How did they evolve? So, presu you know, presumably, they've got the same type of information in inside of them. Uh, that's not an answer at all, right? And in fact, um, Michael Denton, molecular biologist, says nothing illustrates clearly just how intractable a problem the origin of life has become than the fact that world authorities can seriously toy with the idea of panspermia. And this is, the, this is what Francis Crick called his idea, panspermia. Uh, uh, pan meaning, meaning everywhere, all around, like DNA is all around, and, and spermia meaning, you know, seed. Uh, so life was seeded from spaceships from somewhere all around. Now, we, we could kind of get into some side conversations at this point. Um, sometimes when I'm talking with, with an atheist that's maybe a scientist uh, who's a physicist or a biologist, and they say, well, yeah, we've we found biomolecules on meteorites that have landed on Earth. That's great. You found biomolecules. That is a far, far cry from even what we call a simple cell. How do you get from a biomolecule to a cell with all of the intricate things inside of it, the DNA, the code, you can't get there. And by the way, when they find these biomolecules, they're what they're called, they're, they're, they're racemic is the word, meaning that there's left-handed molecules and right-handed molecules, and when you have that in life, they don't work. You need one hand or the other. Um, it, it's, it's a problem, but at any rate, uh, we're not gonna go down that, that sidetrack very much further than I already did. When you put all this together, and this, this, I firmly believe this, and I believe that science, there's a revolution happening in science where we're kind of coming back to this. When you look at the science, when you look deeper and deeper in the cell, and the goalposts of evolutionary ideology just keep getting moved further and further out, I believe science does not lead to a disbelief in God. Not at all. Just the opposite. I believe that when you do science, that it believes that it moves you to a disbelief in atheism because you just you, you you can't get there you can't get from point a to point b using the evolutionary engine that we keep talking about so going back to our anchor verse and we'll kind of wrap this session up psalms 139 14 i will give thanks to you david talking about god talking about his creator for i am fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well We've looked at different parts of this verse in previous sessions, and today I just kind of want to focus on that middle piece. Wonderful are your works. When we look at alternative splicing, when we look at a genetic code that can reprogram itself over time, we, we have to give credit to something, to someone. And I believe in giving honor where honor is due. That's a biblical concept. And in this case, we give credit all to our Creator, all to the intelligent mind who has no limits or no bounds when it comes to uh, thinking and knowledge. So that's going to wrap it up for our four dimensions today. And the, the next session, I want to go a little bit, we'll go a little bit deeper into some of the, um, the molecular machines while we're looking at energy and how energy is made in the cell. Uh, thank you for attention. Look forward to our next session.